Okay, folks, we are ready to get started. Uh, we are continuing our study on the 119th Psalm, and we are at verse 97. Now, while you're turning to that, let me remind you of a couple things coming up this week. It's good to see such a good crowd here tonight, and we're glad to have those who've joined us online as well. Uh, tomorrow is Soup Kitchen Day, and we are going to need some folks at the soup kitchen at 1130 uh, to help with uh, serving the food, and that's from 12 to 1. The actual serving of the food is from 12 to 1, and Pastor Jason and Kathy are the ones to talk to about that. I'm, I've got a funeral to attend. So. Okay, Jane, Jane's going to be there, so speak to them. I've got a funeral um, at noon, and... Um, so, but but we will need some help with that. Also, I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 It's gonna be real simple, but we just need help. Um, also, Sunday is Men's Day, so men, we want to get you all in the choir, and if anybody uh, wants to do something special, let me know. We've got some that are lined up to do testimonies, but if but if somebody wants to um, to do the opening prayer or or uh, anything like that, let me know. Do announcements, whatever. Let me know if you'd like to be a part of that tonight, please, so we can get that finalized. But we're we're pretty good. Otherwise, we're pretty well covered. Um, we have a sign up sheet for uh, Faith and Family Night, the Carolina Hurricanes. Uh, we reserved 25 tickets. We got 13 of them already spoken for. And uh, I'm going to pass this around in case you've thought about it and would like to sign up or somebody that didn't know about it would like more information. It's right here. Uh, it is, uh, there is going to be a time of testimony. One of the players after, afterward that we'll get to be with, they also get a commemorative hockey puck. And um, uh, we're leaving at 3.30. Uh, we'll stop for dinner on the way. And, of course, they have a lot of goodies at the game if anybody wants to pay for those. They're not, they're not cheap. They, um, they, they are very proud of that food. Um, but, it's a, but it's a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot of fun just to have everybody together. So if you'd like to go, it's $35 per person. If you're um, online, you need to call the office between 9 and 1 and get signed up. And... Um, it's February 25th, and we have to have an idea how many is going by the 24th of January. Um, oh, yeah, it's going to be fun just to be together, to do something together as a group. But, um, but it's, it's usually pretty addictive once you, once you get there and, and see it in person. It's a lot different. Yeah. So it's kind of like boxing with a little bit of ice skating in, included, but it's some, um, but it's different. Um, it's very different in person than it is on TV. That's for sure. Very, very different. Um, also, and and we do have, um, we we are in first place. We are in first place in our division. And um, Metropolitan Division is the hardest division in hockey, and we're in first place. So, um, should be a good. Should be a good game. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I apologize for running a little late. I was meeting with the preschool committee. We've got some exciting things happening there. Um, met with our um, engineers yesterday, and we're hoping to have some plans in hand in a matter of a couple of weeks or so. So um, we'll, we'll, things will start picking up steam as far as um, plans go for for the new building and the renovations and everything that take place over at the old Robert L. School as soon as all that comes in. Let's go to the Lord in prayer now. Father, we thank you for all the good things that you do and all the good things that happen in our, in our families, in the life of our church. And Lord, we know that there's a lot of, there's still a lot of need. There's still a lot of, uh, a lot of issues that people are dealing with in their day-to-day -day lives that we need to lift up to you. And Lord, we will 
I know we'll spend more time talking about those later in our service, but we, we do acknowledge that and ask you to, to intercede as only you can to guide us as we uh, minister and reach out and love one another. Father, we pray now that you would guide us as we study your word. Help us, Lord, to, to recognize just how important it is for us to, to, to love your word and, and to make it a priority in our lives. And help us to just focus upon what you want to say to us about that tonight. We make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let me just uh, also uh, remind you that there will be um, a funeral service tomorrow at Pleasant Grove Baptist Church at noon for Corey Stewart's grandmother. Uh, Miss Sarah uh, passed away, and um, the service will be at noon. Visitation is from 11 to 12 and other times at the home. And if you need that address, you can let me know. Uh, but it's down US 1 South, and the church, Pleasant Grove, is not far off of US 1 South um, as well. So we're at Psalm 119, verse 97 and following. And these are eight verses to per stanza, and each one, as we've talked about, is a is a, a part of an acrostic. Uh, the title for each of these stanzas is part of an acrostic, an acrostic, acrostic of the, pardon? Yeah, I'm trying. But of the uh, Hebrew alphabet. And so we are at Mem is the, um, the heading for this particular stanza. And beginning with verse 97, it reads, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies. For they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way, that I may keep your word. I have not departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Uh, have you ever seen people who have just discovered the love of their life and, and, just, and, and just recognized how exciting it is for them? They've met the love of their life and, and you just see something in them that wasn't there before. They're happy and, and maybe even silly. They try to stay close to their loved one all the time. They keep their eyes on them and, and just stare sometimes. They delight in every word that's said. This is the kind of language that the psalmist is using about God's word. I love your word. This is what he means when he says, oh, how I love your law. He's talking about the word of God. He delights in God's word. And he says, it's my meditation all the day. In other words, the word of God stays on his mind all day long. How many of us can say that we focus our minds on God's word all the time. That's what the psalmist said. He's come to appreciate the value of God's word so much he can't take his eyes off of it. He can't get the truth of God's word out of his mind. 
So this is not some kind of short-term infatuation, but it's a long-term loving commitment to the Word of God. In the next verses of this stanza, there are five reasons that God's Word should be the first love of our lives. And the first one we see in verses 98 through 100, it makes us wise. That's an effect of extensive meditation on the Word of God. It makes us wise. He says, through your commandments, I'm wiser than my enemies because your word's always with me. And we live in a world with fast-moving facts, instant news. We can learn stuff just in, in a brief amount of time. And we used to have to wait till the 11 o'clock news, you know? The 6 o'clock news gave us what had happened up to that time, and then at 11 o'clock we could find it. Now, instantly, we can pull it up on our phones. Day and night, we get immediate news, immediate facts. But you know, the ability to make good decisions isn't always so instant. It's not always so easy for us, even those of us who love God and who study His Word. We see substance abuse all around us, broken families. We see personal debt that destroys relationships. But if we move closer to God's ways and His truth, we move farther away from those things. If we focus more intently on His Word constantly, then we can move away from all of the things that, that we see going on around us. Our journey begins hearing the gospel. That's how we come to Christ. We have to hear the gospel first of all. That brings a foundation of wisdom to our lives. But that's not enough. We've got to grow and build upon that. In 2 Timothy 3.15, the Apostle Paul Tells us how to be wise. I know everybody's flipping all at once, but in Second Timothy three fifteen, somebody read that verse and tell us what does Paul say? Three fifteen. So how do we become wise? Learn the scriptures. Know the scriptures. Know the word. That's how we become truly wise. That's, and it begins by hearing the word. Even as a child. Paul said about Timothy. Because his mother and his grandmother. They, they shared with him the scriptures. From the time he was a little child. When we hear the scriptures, we realize that without God in our lives, we're separated from his truth. We're, we're, we're lost, and we need a relationship with him. God is the source of wisdom, so we have to connect to him in order to make good decisions. God has preserved his word for us. The truth of God is found in the Bible, preserved for thousands of years. 
It's reliable. It's trustworthy. It is truth. And he keeps this available to us so that we can filter out the, the foolish things of this world, the things that would uh, cause us to be distracted or to make poor decisions. The wisdom of God is, is like a two-sided sword. It cuts through foolishness in every direction. It's important for us as Christian soldiers, to keep the word, our, our, our offensive weapon, the sword, ready for every circumstance. See, there's not a day in our lives when we won't need to rely on the word of God. There's not a day in our lives or a circumstance we encounter that we don't need the word of God. And we have to use it to cut through the, the evil in this world. The foolishness in this world. The deceitfulness. I, I heard a song, I guess it was Sunday morning, uh, on the radio that I'd never heard before. It was a really old gospel song. But it said, basically it said, the devil's not afraid of a dusty Bible. The devil's not afraid of a dusty Bible. How true is that? We've got to stay in the Word. We've got to study the Word. We've got to hide it in our hearts. So we have to use our sword, our weapon, whether it's at work or school, at home, at church, and there are two examples here in verses 99 and 100. I have more understanding than all my teachers. For your testimonies or your word is my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts or your word. Everything that we hear, every teaching, that we encounter. We need to measure it by the word of God. You know. Even, even people who, who may think. That they're teaching us. Something that's biblical. If they're not accurate. We need to realize that. And so it helps us. To know the word ourselves. As we're being taught. We need to. Measure everything by his revelation of truth. And that, you know, it doesn't matter what the education level of the teacher is. But not everyone is, is, is infallible like God is. Therefore, his word is infallible. There's. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, basically gives us a command of how we can judge what's being taught, what's being, uh, you know, what we're hearing. 1 John chapter 4, Verse 1, what does, what does that say? The Spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Okay. Don't believe everything you hear is basically what he's saying there. Instead, test the spirits according to the word. Lean on the word of God. In verse 99, the word that's translated as understanding, where he says, I have more understanding, is the word sawkow. And it refers to something done right. 
an action that's done right based upon the knowledge that we have. So my understanding is not just a head knowledge, it's a head knowledge that leads to good works, that leads to doing something positive that God has planned for us to do. Kind of like um, the word prudence. God's word, when it's applied God's way, is the work that we do to bear fruit. When we, you know, just to know what the word says, and go out there and 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 pontificate, you know, and say, okay, well, here's here's what God's word says, but we don't do it, don't apply it. We're not accomplishing any good fruit, are we? We're not we're not producing any good fruit. But if we use it to do what God intends us to do, then we produce good fruit. And the Bible says by their fruit you shall know them. Not by their knowledge. Not by their intelligence. And it's always interesting for me to listen to somebody who's really smart and who really knows a lot about the Bible and the history of the Word and the history of, of the, the Holy Land and, 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 you know, can really bring a lot of that together. But are they producing fruit for God? Do they know in such a way that they're living it out? Are they applying it in their lives? God's Word should be our first love because it makes us wise. But secondly, it keeps us holy. Verse 101 says, I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. That's how it keeps us holy. When we know it and practice it, it restrains us from making bad decisions. God's word keeps us on a path of righteousness. It keeps us properly oriented as we walk through confusing circumstances. God's word is, is, is kind of like a compass. You know? If, if you're going out on a hike, and you get disoriented. You lose your way. And, and it becomes nighttime. And you don't have a compass. You don't have a map. You don't have your cell phone with you. What do you do? You panic, most likely. How do you know the direction you're supposed to go? without something to guide you. If you have a map, if you have those tools, a light, a map, a compass, even just those, you know how to read a map, and you know how to use a compass, then you have the tools that you need to guide you on your journey. It's very important. For some people, it's, it's GPS now. If your GPS, now I, I don't know about you, but I, it seems like most of the time GPS takes me in circles and, and, and sometimes takes me to the wrong place altogether. You know, when in life, it's easy for us to get, to find ourselves in, in unfamiliar territory, in difficult terrain. And, and we, we look around and we don't really know which way to go. We need guidance. And God's word gives us the guidance we need in life. It's like a map. And 
God's word is always ready and able to show us how to get through the confusion. Situation may be a mystery to us. The good, good news is it's not to God. He knows how to get through it. He knows what's on the other side. He knows the path we need to take to get there. And eventually he'll guide us to our heavenly home. We've got to follow him. We've got to follow his, his word. King David took many strange and, and dangerous detours during his life. But in the 23rd Psalm, in verse 3, he made a statement about God leading him. What did he say? I, in verse 3, he leads me in the paths of righteousness. The way we should be going. If we follow him. But we grow in our love for God's word because it leads us safely in the way God intends us to go. So it should be our, our, our first love. It makes us wise. It keeps us holy. And thirdly, it deepens our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Verse 102 says, I have not departed from your command, your judgment. For you yourself have taught me. Whatever God speaks happens. He's in control, not us. And whatever he wants is what happens. In creation story of Genesis 1, God says, let there be light. And what's the next Part of that verse. There was light. God spoke and it happened. In John 21, we read about a fisherman who had not, and he was a good fisherman. He was somebody who had made his living as a fisherman. But he had not caught a single fish all night. But then Jesus came up. What did Jesus tell him to do? I think that's what I heard. Cast his net on the on the right side. Just one more try. Do it on the right side of the ship this time. What happened? About sank the boat, didn't he? So much fish that he couldn't pull the nets into the boat. And when we respond to God's word in faith, God draws us closer to him. We see things like that happen. In Matthew 6, Jesus says that we should not be primarily concerned about money or food or clothes and things such as that. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. Remember what he says in verse 33, Matthew 6, 33? He says, but we should do something else. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to. And that's not all of the things we want in the world. It's the things that he had just finished talking about. The, the clothing, shelter, food, the important things that we need to live. So not all of our wants, but all of our needs will be met is the point that Christ was making. If we seek His kingdom, His righteousness, not our own kingdom that we're trying to build, but His, He'll make sure our needs are met. And He doesn't just mean that for you and me. He means that for us as a church, too. If we are following His command, He's going to meet our needs. Um, those words, they come from the same heart, mouth of the God who said, let there be light. 
part of the Trinity. When God said, let there be light, Christ was there speaking those words. Let there be light. The same mouth that said, cast your nets on the other side of the boat. And we see what happened there. See, God can and will do miraculous things today. Not just in history. And if we open our eyes to it, we see it all around us. We see him at work. We see him performing miracles. So as we hear and obey these words, we should love him more. And we should love his word more. Another reason his word should be our first love is that it is sweet soul food. Not what the kind of soul food you might be thinking about. about. But look at verse 103. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. What's your favorite dessert? Think about that. Everybody's got one. At least one. <laughs> if not multiple. And, 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 you know, we sometimes, we just got to have it, you know. Sometimes it, it, it's all that'll do is to have that one thing, whether it's ice cream or cake or pie or a certain something that we don't get very often. What if our spiritual taste buds craved God's word the way we crave our favorite dessert? Whatever that may be. I mean, sometimes, you know, whether it's dessert or, or, or some other food, you know, we just got to have it, nothing else to do. Do we feel that way about God's Word? The thing about it, if we feast on our favorite dessert, we might regret it. You know, if it's if we're we're so craving it so much that we just don't stop when we should, our, our tummies might make us regret it. But that never happens with God's word. We never get too much of God's word. We never get sick on God's word. So the the word of God, spiritually speaking, tastes like a dessert. It's sweet. The psalmist says. But it's as healthy for us as, as spinach. We continually grow in our love for God's word. Because it makes us wise. It keeps us holy. It deepens our relationship with our father. It's sweet soul food. And finally. It guides our hatred of sin. Verse 104. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. We often use a phrase that we probably have heard since we were young. Love the sinner, but hate the sin. Heard that phrase, used it. Love the sinner, but hate the sin. Um, a mother who has a child who's going to stray can't truly love her child unless she hates those things that are destroying her child. Right? Imagine... A mother whose child is lured into substance abuse as a teenager. Lives wrecked with the misery of addiction. The mother hates the sin of substance abuse because it destroys the life of her child that she loves so. That's, that's what... I think all of us can relate to in that scenario. 
Well, likewise, God hates sin because it destroys people he loves. In the end, God will, will pour out his wrath on the lost and on Satan because they love sin more than they love the truth of God's word, more than they love his grace. According to Jesus' words in John chapter 3, verse 20, why do people hate God's word? John 3, 20. Why do people hate God's word? They are of Satan. What does the word say in verse 20? Uh, they're evil. They're of Satan. And they hate the light, which we know is, is, is Christ. He said, I'm the light of the world. And he says, you're the light of the world, my children. But they hate the light because it, light exposes things in the dark. And it exposes the sinfulness of people. The light of God's word exposes the sin of those who are evil. Because of our fallen nature, we, we hate truth. Because it exposes our sins. When God raises us up from sin, we realize what we've been feasting on is slop. It's like the prodigal son. From that perspective, we learn... We too hate sin. Because we see it destroy lives. So, the five reasons God's word should be our first love. It makes us wise. Keeps us holy. It deepens our relationship with our Father. It's sweet soul food. And it guides our hatred of sin. Thoughts. Comments. That's an awesome love. That's a, you know, a very radical kind of love. In the same way that God loved us unconditionally, I believe it's a love to turn that same love to everyone around us. Mm -hmm. That's not always easy to do. Especially someone we know who you know, is allowing Satan to destroy their lives or sin to destroy their lives. And they don't seem to care. We keep loving them. We keep pursuing them with love. Um, we don't like what they're doing, but we love them. And it's all the more important that we let them know we love them. Tell them every chance we get. Show them. And we don't have to approve of whatever choices, poor choices they're making. To love them.
You know, a lot of times we, we take a lot of pride in saying, well, I've read the Bible through 10 times in my lifetime or whatever the case may be. But if we read it through without really giving much thought to what we're reading, if we're just trying to accomplish completing that reading, are we really benefiting from that? I'd rather not even read half of it and to spend that time meditating on that, learning it, and working on applying that than to kind of aimlessly read through. Yeah, you, you follow GPS. You know, it's, it's, it's funny because I, I've always had a pretty good sense of direction. And, and you know, I, I kind of look at the sky sometimes, you know, in the daytime and, you know, it's... It's noon, I know the sun's down here, we're, you know, that's south, and, you know, I'm kind of, I've always had a pretty good way with that, and, you know, my kids now, they're like, uh, I'm like, how do you get from here to there? They said, you put it in your, in your phone. I said, what do you mean? You just put it in your phone, you follow your phone. Said, what if your phone's not right? Well, then you try something else. I mean... Mm -hmm. Hey, I know the question I'm bringing to you, but I'm going to show them. Yeah. You had to listen to Grandma. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. I mean, they don't, they don't always lead you the right way. Um, they're not foolproof. Yeah, Sandy. And, and I think that's, you know, of course, you know, the Word teaches the importance of accountability. But, you know, that's, that's something that we help each other with as well. Um, you know, and in reading the Word, it's so important to have people who are accountability buddies, for lack of a better term, you know, an accountability group, whether it's one or two other people that, you know, you're just reminding each other, what are you reading in the Word? What are you, what are you learning in the Word lately? And you can do that without being accusatory, without, without um, causing someone to, to feel bad, but it just reminds us, you know, somebody else cares that I'm learning. Somebody else cares that I'm growing. And I can encourage them in the same way. And usually we know that, you know, I need to get back in church. Or I need to get back in my accountability group, in my class, whatever the case may be, because my light is going dim. I haven't been, you know, fanning that flame like I should. Any other thoughts? You know, she didn't have a lot of money. Worked in a mill, minimum wage all of her life. No matter what she needed, it was there for her because she blessed other people. And 
one day one day a rope started breaking and a contractor down the street you know noticed you know notice he's outside looking up at a rope came by and said what's wrong well he and his son repaired that weekend set up a whole new roof for it no charge to her so I think one benefit of of following God's word and brushing your leaves is that blessings come back to you mm-hmm. that's good Well, we thank you for joining us, those who've joined us online. Hope that you will um, keep in mind tomorrow we're doing soup kitchen over at the uh, Hamlet Soup Kitchen. Uh, Sunday is Men's Day. Hope you can come and be with us in person. Men, come join us in the choir. Um, And then uh, don't forget about the sign-up if you'd like to attend the Hurricanes game, uh, February 25th. A lot going on in our lives, a lot going on in our church family, and we just want to keep each other lifted up and hope to see you very soon.